Welcome to SKNIS Perspectives, an interactive program of the St. Kitts and Nevis Information Service, aired weekly on this radio station. On today's edition, the records show that there have been impacts in Nevis, for example, Jamaica, and in the Virgin Islands many years ago. The threat of a tsunami to the Caribbean region is a distinct possibility, and officials from NEMA are producing a national document to guide response strategies should one occur. Plus, Michael Blake talks about plans to reduce risk to life and property in school in the event of a disaster. School safety must, of necessity, be an integral part of school planning and school running. I'm Ian Richards. Stay tuned for Perspectives. And I'm speaking to the National Disaster Coordinator, Carl Herbert. Mr. Herbert, tsunami is what most persons think of a natural disaster in St. Kitts and Nevis. They often think about an earthquake or a hurricane, which is, of course, something that we deal with every year in terms of preparing for them. But I don't think there's enough thought given to tsunamis. That is true because you recognize it's not an annual or regular threat. But when there was that major earthquake and tsunami in the Asian continent... A thousand region recognized that it is something that we really need to give more attention to. And as a result of that, efforts have been increased through UNESCO to try to get the region more prepared. For those who may not be aware, explain what is a tsunami and what causes it. Tsunami is one of the hazards that can affect several countries, including some of us in the Caribbean. It tends to mainly occur as a result of a major earthquake. And it really is the movement of a large mass of seawater from the ocean onto the land, which is very destructive. And tell us a bit about the history of tsunamis in the region, because as you mentioned, it's not something that occurs regularly. There's some persons who would have seen the footage on television, tsunami in Japan, and also the one in Indonesia, and say, well, you know, that's on the other side of the world. It is not something that I have to be concerned about. The records show that there have been impacts in Nevis, for example, Jamaica, and in the Virgin Islands many years ago. But the very fact that it did occur brings to the fore that it can occur again. So that's the reason why there is the ongoing efforts to get preparedness in place. And when you say many years ago, are you speaking specifically about decades ago, about centuries ago? A few centuries ago. And so what do you say to the person who thinks then that that was, you know, back then it is not going to necessarily happen now? There are some things we can't predict. And because of that, it is important that one tries to be as prepared as one can because of the uncertainty. And so then in that case, tell us what exactly NEMO has been engaging in. Last week, we participated in an international exercise which focused on the Western Atlantic, the Caribbean, and adjacent regions where the Intergovernmental Coordination Group for Tsunami and Other Coastal Hazards Warning Systems for the Caribbean and adjacent regions held an exercise where countries received information via email coming out of a scenario that there was a tsunami threat, and it provided the opportunities for countries to respond to the information towards looking at their own preparedness. So for us, we had what we call an orientation exercise, basically education, information sharing about the tsunami threat itself. That's recognizing that we have not done much work in that area. Most countries do not have a tsunami plan. And so that is part of why the exercise was held to get the different agencies to look at scenarios and to look at their roles, responsibilities as we seek to put a document in place. What are some of the partners that attended this meeting? Well, we had persons from the public and private sector and NGOs. For example, we had fire and rescue, police, we had government departments, we had the chamber, we invited persons from the the bulk storage facility. So it was a wide cross-section of persons. This activity was also done on Nevis simultaneously. And what would you say the feedback was like? Well, it was very good in the sense that persons got a better appreciation of the complexity of this hazard tsunami, and it provided information which some people either did not know or or provided what we would say as a refresher for some persons. And did they necessarily, um, from the onset understand the importance of the preparatory work that was being done, not necessarily suggesting that, of course, that it will happen, but that, of course, that we need to be prepared in case something were to happen. 
Well, certainly there was that clear appreciation for it and interest. Certain recommendations were made and we are going to take those on board as we consider different strategies, different approaches going forward. Any of those that you get to share this time? Well, the critical area of public education information, that was one. Also the area of looking at how we are going to alert people in mass and also how one would recover from the impact of such an hazard. Let's talk a bit about that now. Um, let's take, for instance, God forbid, one word to develop. What systems, early warning systems, are in place to prepare the public to inform them in terms of what needs to be done to protect themselves? That is part of the challenge most of us face in the region. We only have radio, television, and uh, the various telecommunication service providers. So we have to use what we have, and that is part of why we engage in the exercise, so as to see the gaps and to see where we can put heads together to improve that early warning system. You mentioned that a national document was being prepared. Tell us a bit about that document. Well, that is what will eventually be done. We have information about several plans that other countries will use, and so we are going to use the information that came out of the exercise and apply it to what we have from other countries as part of an adaptation process. Specifically to tsunamis? Certainly, yes, yes. Is there a timeline for when this document should be completed? Well, we want to get the draft out as soon as possible. So we really want to make sure that by the end of the year, or even sooner, that we have such a document in place. Any final comments that you'd like to leave us with? Just want to thank you for the opportunity to expose this challenging hazard to the nation and to urge persons to learn as much as they can about it, listen to the media, look at the television as we will put out information. But if you go on the internet also, type in the word tsunamis and look, make a search, you'll find lots of information about it. We want to urge the public to become educated, not only by just depending on us, but by doing their own research where they can. I could mention that the most important thing that a person can do if there is any threat is to seek higher ground. Oh, certainly, certainly. Whether that is a hillside or a tall building, whatever is available, that is what we would recommend you use at the time. National Disaster Coordinator Carl Herbert, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, sir. We expand our look at disaster preparation now by focusing on efforts to provide schools with the necessary information and equipment to survive a disaster. And I'm speaking to Mr. Michael Blake, who is a senior education officer at the Ministry of Education. And Mr. Blake, we are here to talk a bit about um, safety in schools. I understand that you play an integral role for the ministry with regard to that. Explain to us how so. In a manner of speaking, the Ministry of Education has wisely recognized that school safety should occupy a central role in our plans and in our execution of whatever plans we construct. And so in recent times, the matter of school safety has assumed a critical role and an officer has been appointed to coordinate the school safety regime. Uh, that happens to be myself. And incidentally, I have been exposed to quite a bit of training in matters of disaster risk reduction in the education sector and in school safety matters, even before I assumed my current position. I have been involved with NEMA, for example, as a district manager, an assistant district manager for a number of years, and I have an intrinsic interest in disaster mitigation and disaster reduction and disaster-related matters. And so, in that capacity, as the officer in the ministry responsible for school safety, I have been actively engaged in ensuring that a number of things are in place to take the concept of school safety from theory and ideal into practice and action. Tell us a bit about the post itself. When was it created and when did you assume the job title? This happened about two years ago, just as the current Minister of Education was coming into office. It was recognized that there was need to move from an ad hoc haphazard kind of attention to matters of school safety to one where it is structured and, and more focused and there is a deliberate emphasis on matters involving school safety. You see, it is clear, we think, that the experience of other countries is instructive. 
we have noticed in several territories within the Caribbean and beyond a number of instances where a disaster struck while school was in session and the number of school students, children and teachers lost their lives. And we do not wish to be reactive in this respect. We would want to put in place measures to prevent a similar kind of tragedy here. For example, a few years ago in China, up to 33,000 children died in an earthquake. If we were to have a similar number of persons, instant kids, succumbing in that way, we're talking about the entire population, more or less. And um, even on a per capita basis, it would be real hell on earth, to put it that way, if we were to have a disaster of any kind that claimed those kinds of numbers of lives. And so the school safety program is designed to put into place mechanisms which situate that in the event of a disaster striking while school is in session, damage to property and more importantly, injury or injury to or loss of life is absolutely minimized. And so, of course, the project entitled School Safety and Disaster Mitigation in Public Schools. Disaster Risk Reduction. Okay, Disaster Risk Reduction. Tell us a bit about some of the activities under that project. Well, certainly we've engaged in training of selected teachers. Each school would have appointed its point man, for that matter. We would have taken those persons together and subjected them to training of various types so that each school can boast, as it were, a cadre of teachers who know how to respond, who can lead the charge in ensuring that students and teachers, the school population in general, respond in the appropriate way so as to, as I said earlier, reduce any damage or injury to its barest minimum. We have also trained the principals themselves. We have instructed them, for example, in ways to create a school safety plan. And we are desirous that this plan not just be an exercise in academia, an exercise in just ensuring that there is a document. No, but we want this plan to be one that guides, that directs, that shapes the behavior of teachers, students, and all who work on the school premises in a way that enables them to respond appropriately to the visitation of any disaster. We have gone further, I have to say. We wrote a proposal to UNESCO for some funds to acquire equipment. Certainly, physical training is good, but it is insufficient. Schools need certain basic equipment which would enable them to respond to any disaster. For example, fire extinguishers. Only one or two schools had one or two fire extinguishers. Now, through the project uh, funded by UNESCO and also by SIDEMA, we have been able to acquire enough fire extinguishers to have at least one in each school, primary and secondary. We have also received or are in the process of distributing other types of equipment, such as megaphones, bullhorns, first aid kits, water boots, step ladders, bells, electronic alarm systems. We have acquired hoses, toolkits. We have also been instrumental in ensuring that schools which suffer from a serious problem with fire ants, that they have the solution to this particular problem. In other words, the relevant substances, the relevant material, insecticide and so on, to deal with those matters. So we have approached school safety via a number of prongs. We've had training, we've had exposure, we've had... Uh, procurement of equipment and of course we have trained teachers and others in the use of these equipment. We can't just put fire extinguishers in schools for example so we've had the fire department come on board to assist us in training teachers how to use the fire extinguishers properly. We've had the Red Cross come in to train teachers in how to use every single item in the first aid kit so that they know which dressing for example to apply to which type of injury and things like that. So we're satisfied that we're on the right track. Interesting that you point out that it's something not necessarily related specifically to hurricanes and earthquakes, which most persons would automatically come to mind at first. But the simple things that makes it very practical, such as the fire ants, as you mentioned. Of course. Let me hasten to add that we've also had evacuation drills. We've had simulation exercises. The latest one we had, for example, was at Irish Home Primary School, where the students were subject to an emergency procedure, assuming that a tsunami was about to strike and we know that Irish Town is pretty close to the sea down there in McKnight area and we had the students and teachers evacuate the school and head for higher ground within 13 minutes. In fact um, the first student arrived within 8 minutes 
and it took another five minutes for all the students. The last person to arrive was the principal herself. She got there after 13 minutes because, rightly so, as they have been trained, she is to stay behind to ensure that everyone else has been evacuated. And so we also engage in, in that aspect of school safety. We are ensuring that schools have identified a safe zone, a safe zone for earthquake, having done the DCH, where do they proceed thereafter, a safe zone for fire, a safe zone for tsunami, a safe zone for those schools which might very well be in close proximity to a volcanic eruption. What is their safe zone? And then, having identified a safe zone, we conduct drills in collaboration with the School Safety Council, with NEMA, the fire department and so on, to see how quickly students can access that safe zone via prescribed evacuation routes to ensure once again that students, teachers are as safe as possible in the event of a disaster striking while school is in session. And I may add, I'm emphasizing, of course, the idea of response while school is in session. But we know that transfer of learning occurs automatically. And so we expect that what the students learn at school, they will actually translate it into action if they were to be subject to a hazard or disaster while at home. So what we're doing in school, again, is going to affect, in a positive way, the homes and, by extension, the wider community. Which actually leads to my next question where I was asking about the support, or I was going to ask about the support that the parents have given to this initiative. Have you gotten any feedback from them? Oh, yes. Via PTAs and radio calling programs, for example, we have monthly radio and television discussions in which the public is invited to participate, and we've had some good feedback. Parents express their views on this question of school safety, and we have not had one word of dissent. What we have had, in fact, are words of congratulation and commendation and offers of assistance because we have, of course, parents who themselves might be au okay fait with what some disaster response action should be like. We have some parents who are well endowed economically, financially, so they can offer assistance in a tangible way. They might want to donate a bin, a garbage bin. They might want to donate a bell, you know, things like that. So we have engaged the parents as we ought to do in education, since education cannot do and is not expected to do anything on its own, but certainly in close cooperation with other major stakeholders, parents, of course, being among the most major. And so what's the future for this program? Well, we are optimistic that we are basically just falling in line with what is a current international trend where there's a lot of emphasis on school safety and that school safety instruction is now embedded in teachers training colleges as part of the curriculum in Latin American countries, for example, and in the developed world, school safety is a normal part of quotidian school life. It is not just something which has been added on as an afterthought. But you would agree with me, I'm sure, and the general public would agree, that it is no use having one of the most modern schools with all the latest scientific equipment, for example, well-trained teachers and students who are ebullient in their approach to learning, and there is nothing to do with school safety. So the slightest incident that occurs, there is mass hysteria, and that could result in mass casualties. So school safety must, of necessity, be an integral part of school planning and school running. And we are hopeful that as we embark on this program, it will only be strengthened in the future. We expect to continue to access sources for funding and training and so on, and that this process will be successful. And we know that success generates its own momentum. Success likes nothing else but success. Success breeds success. And so we are hoping that the success of this program in the initial stages would lend and lead to a platform for further perennial, perpetual success in school safety. And just finally, Mr. Blake, you mentioned, of course, that in Latin American countries, for instance, that school safety is included in the curriculum of mm-hmm. teachers being trained. Is that something that eventually will happen here? We are going to engage in advocacy in that respect, and we are hoping that the School Safety Council, which, by the way, is led by Captain Walter Bass of the St. Kitts Defense Force, We are hoping that groups like that, the Principals Association, the Students' Councils in the various schools, would also participate in advocating very vociferously that school safety, in a very structured and organized way, with deliberate content material, be a part not only of the teachers' training college curriculum, but also as part of the school curriculum. So that students from early stages, let's say as early as grade three in the primary school, would be immersed in the knowledge of what to do 
both at school and at home with respect to ensuring that there is safety. Because that's what it's all about, ensuring that lives are preserved. And that being so, we move to the next stage to ensure that damage to property is reduced. So Michael Blake, thank you very much for speaking to us. My pleasure. And that's our program. If you would like to hear this edition again or any other program from this year, visit our new Facebook page or YouTube channel. Just run a quick search for SKNIS St. Kitts and Nevis Information Service on Facebook and the SKNIS on YouTube. A number of interesting information and video pieces can also be found on these accounts, so be sure to give them a view. I'm Ian Richards, wishing you a very blessed Holy Week. We're pleased that you joined us for this edition of SKNIS Perspectives. Join us every week at this same time on this radio station. This program is produced by the St. Kitts and Nevis Information Service.